Don't forget, coming up in the next hour, we have I wish a, buck was a lawyer coming on, Judith McGarry, head of Farm and Ranch Freedom. We're going to go over all the legislation to start shutting down the family farms and ranches they're trying to pass. And it's all stated by the United Nations under Agenda 21. Uh, they cite China as the model to control us. I mean, you can't make up this nightmare. And so I want you to know the plan here, hearing about Mao. And remember, Stalin did similar things, but just not on the same scale. Uh, we have, a, again, very prestigious researcher and professor on with us. And we're going to talk more about the book itself that goes into uh, just horrifying uh, detail. Uh, continuing with your research, uh, we were getting into the point, Professor. This is a short segment, long segment coming up. Uh, I was asking the question about 64 million is the number I see from the U.S. government. Where do they come up with that number? Do you know? Um, pure speculation. Pure speculation. I really don't believe that uh, anybody's got any way of finding out how many died till we have full access to the archives. That's not going to happen anytime soon. But in a four-year period, it's 45 mil. Yeah, it is. So it might be a lot more. We, we simply don't know. What was it like for you when, when you got access to this? A and B, how did you get access? Well, I didn't exactly walk in and ask them to show me all the files about how they went around killing 45 million people. And they didn't exactly hand it over on a golden plate either. So it was all um, very indirect in the sense that I was asking to look at um, economic history of that period. Um, and there was a lot of goodwill in the couple of years before the Olympics. There was a sense of opening up and making more material available. There was a good feel factor. And I used that time to read as much as I could in several dozen party archives, city archives, county archives, provincial archives. And um, in some cases, um, I didn't find much at all. In other cases, um, I simply wasn't allowed to read anything. And once in a while, I got very, very lucky. And when I read it, I have to say, I, I was quite prepared for, for, for tragedy, but nothing, nothing like what I encountered in the archives. I was still under the impression, like many others, that there simply wasn't enough food available, and that was why people died of hunger. I had no idea that the scope, the scale of coercion was, was so overwhelming. I had no idea that violence was, was very much the way in, in, in which those uh, four years were, were governed by the party. Well, Professor DeCotter, uh, looking uh, at what happened uh, in in China, in 75, they started the one-child policy as taxes, as you know, and then in 80 uh, as law. I mean, it seems like China, well, we know they want to get rid of some of their population. Uh, and I'd seen in the 70s party leaders saying we would benefit from a nuclear war. So was, was there an idea that wiping out the, the, the countryside people, you know, uh, might be a good thing? Or, or was it mismanagement? I mean, what was it? Well, it, it, it's, it's, it, it's a complex series of factors. But what you say is, is actually quite accurate in the sense that at the time, people from the countryside were really seen not just socially, but legally, legally, as, as inferior to city residents. In other words, uh, a farmer did not legally matter as much as a, as a city resident. They were very much treated as a special caste. And during the Great Leap Forward, uh, a, a, a sort of, a sort of wall was built around the city, not a real wall, but that the cities were fenced off from the countryside. Well, they do that they now. They lock the uh, rural workers at night in the major cities, AP reports, uh, in basically giant prisons. Well, to, to this day, in fact, any migrant from the countryside can be arrested and locked up. And that law dates from the Great Leap Forward, 1958. Ah. The whole divide of the country, I mean, the real line that runs through that society, the real divide is countryside people and city people. And there's no doubt that the vast majority of victims during the Great Leap Forward, the tens of millions of people who died, were countryside people. And there's no doubt either that they were pretty much at the very bottom of the social hierarchy during that period. 
Amazing, Professor. But but again, uh, the evidence shows, as you're saying, that the culture was already there to discriminate uh, against the rural uh, population. But why do we then see the communists do the same thing uh, in Russia? Uh, and now we see the UN with this attitude, uh, claiming they want to help the rural communities, but actually doing the opposite. Long segment coming up. We're going to get more into your deep research uh, and your book and how people can get it. We're also going to give a website out where folks can learn uh, about all of your wonderful work, uh, a true value to humanity historically, so we don't repeat this. We'll be right back with Professor DeCotter. And we're talking to Professor DeCotter about Mao Zedong, undoubtedly the greatest mass murderer in human history. But I wanted to read a quote here from the New York Times. We actually went and got this from the microfilm. It's in my film Endgame. Blueprint for Global Enslavement. David Rockefeller wrote for the New York Times, August 10, 73, after returning from a successful business trip to China. Whatever the price of the Chinese Revolution, it has obviously succeeded in fostering a high morale and community of purpose. General social and economic progress is no less impressive. The enormous social advances of China have benefited greatly from the singleness of ideology and purpose. The social experiment in China under Chairman Mao's leadership is one of the most important and successful in history. And he goes on in the editorial to praise Mao Zedong. We just got some footage from uh, one of our uh, associates that's done graphics work for us of being in major Chinese cities with the youth brigades marching with their red flags just this year. And uh, whenever they want, they beat people up. I mean, that, you know, that's all part of the fun. And I've got CNN here. CNN tells masses that communism is good for women, despite China's nightmare legacy. W what is it like for you, Professor, being one of the m uh, most respected researchers on Mao and that communist period? I mean, I'm sh surely you've noticed all the glorification of Mao in Europe, Canada, the United States. They're putting statues up for him. Uh, they're, they're basically saying he's a civil rights icon. Uh, is, is that disturbing for you? Yeah, it's quite sickening. Um, g given that what happened only during the Great Leap Forward would be enough to qualify as one of the three greatest, uh, gr greatest man-made disasters of the 20th century. It has, it has to be the Gulag, the Holocaust, and the Great Leap Forward that count as the, the three greatest disasters that were pretty much man-made. Uh, I find it obviously quite, quite sickening. Um, here is a regime that not only destroyed human beings in the tens of millions, um, but also everything else that was in its way that includes untold damage to nature during the Great Leap Forward, with up to half of the forest coverage, coverage lost, housing destroyed, up to 40% in some provinces that are the size of a, of, of, of a European country like France. 40% of the housing destroyed in, in the space of four years. Um, transportation system that would grind to a halt uh, with the Great Leap Forward. I mean, something, its collectivization created such damage at every level that the China that existed before 1949 is just gone forever. And there's the other, another kind of damage that was done when people are reduced to doing everything in order to survive, including eating mud or stealing from their own family members. And that is the, the unraveling of the social fabric and of moral values altogether. Uh, well, you talk about the raping of the land. The website's frankdecotter.com. We have links to it up on infowars.com and prisonplanet.com. I mean, why, why were they de uh, destroying so many homes? I read something about, uh, for quote, fertilizer. Explain that to me. Well, it sounds extraordinary, but it comes back in, 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 in every, every party document that you can find from that period um, that initially muds, mud, mud huts were destroyed or pig sheds in, in, in which animals uh, would have left some organic matter that might be used as fertilizer on the fields. But bit by bit, entire houses are being destroyed. And houses were destroyed for other reasons, not just for fertilizer, but to straighten the roads or to take bricks in order to build up a, a, a people's commune or a canteen or to punish the people who lived inside because they didn't work hard enough or didn't contribute enough grain to the state. An extraordinary level of destruction. And, sir, I've also read about in this communist system with the police, they became fat 
and all these little petty thugs and psychopaths and control freaks, they all got recruited because a loving, good, decent person couldn't do things like this. So it gravitated uh, towards absolute despotism. Can you talk about that psychology? It, in, indeed. It, it isn't just people outside the party who were victims of this, but inside the party, party members who didn't want to go along with these policies, who objected in some way or another, they too were expelled, purged from the party in the millions, in the millions. And other much harder, unscrupulous men were recruited to replace them. And they were willing to go along with anything Mao Zedong said. They were willing to very much trimmed their sails to benefit from these radical winds that were blowing from Peking. So what you get is a party of thugs who are very much willing to do anything to curry favor mm. with the current, with the, with the leadership at the time. History repeats itself over and over again, and people don't recognize it, so they have to live through it. Uh, and I see similar trends worldwide today with the recruiting of thugs, but uh, we're in a lot of trouble uh, Professor, I want to get back into your book and tell folks how they get it and, and, and flesh out some of the other incredible groundbreaking research uh, that uh, you've gotten from the Communist Party archives all over uh, China, including local uh, uh, archives. Uh, but uh, the, how much research have you done on the man, Mao Zedong? Because I read about him never taking a bath, having sex with five, ten women a day, just, uh, just, just, just being a singularly disgusting creature. Th that is very true, and there is a very good biography by uh, Yong Chang on Mao Zedong as a person. And what comes across when you start having access to the minutes of secret leadership meetings is an image of a man who is extremely stubborn on the one hand, not willing to listen to anybody else, but, like, but also extraordinarily vain in the sense that nobody, including number two and number three down the line, down, down, down the hierarchy of power, are really willing to upset this man. And that's linked to a third characteristic that comes across very clearly, and that's paranoia. Here is a man who is at the head of a one-party state and is constantly fearing that there might be somebody stabbing him in the back, somebody undermining him. Um, so... He is very much at the head of a one-party state in which any, any, any failure to curry favor or toe the party line results in, in, in outright dismissal or much further down the line to, to, to um, violence of, of, of extraordinary proportion. Sounds like a bigger scale North Korea. It, it's, it's very much a, a bigger scale North Korea. In fact, I made the comparison uh, about a week ago when I spoke to the Independent in England with Pol Pot um, and Pol Pot and the genocide in Cambodia. I, I described it as 20 times what happened in Cambodia, 20 times what the Khmer Rouge and Pol Pot did. Unbelievable. I, I want to get back into that period, those four years, 45 million killed in one way or the other. But looking at the fact that uh, near the end, Mao's wife became a scapegoat, though she was just as sickening as he was. I want to speak about her and then uh, what China has done to get away from that. But I know they still have the forced labor farming camps. I know a lot of that is still there. It's just hidden in that archipelago uh, throughout the country. But 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 specifically. Uh, going through the, the, the overall span of his reign of terror, his great leap into hell, uh, how things ended for Mao Zedong and how he's seen in China today. Well, Mao Zedong did rather well, unlike Adolf Hitler, um, but not unlike Joseph Stalin. Uh, he died very peacefully in his sleep. After having gotten rid of every single one of his enemies, including number two at the time, head of state, Liu Shaoqi, and very much allowing number three, Zhou Enlai, the diplomat, to, to die of cancer by withholding medical treatment. So he was the one who lived a, a very long life and died in his sleep. How is he considered? Well, I'm sometimes told by people in China that he is still held in great esteem. 